Welcome to another episode of Electable. I'm Deb Chubb, and our podcast is sponsored by the Indiana Women's Action Movement. Um, you can find more information on uh, that organization at indianawam.org. So today, um, this is really interesting and really exciting. Um, we're very, um, very lucky to be joined by Allison Drive. Allison works for an organization called Midwest Access Coalition, right? Yes. Right. <laughs> and um, and this is, uh, this is, you know, part of the journey that we are all on in this abortion story, um, because Midwest Action Coalition, Midwest Access Coalition, um, has been around for a long time, but um, of course their whole lives have changed since um, abortion bans have been in place uh, uh, in, in the various states. So Allison, I, I just wanna um, ask you, you know, if you can just kind of describe what your organization does first, so we can just kind of get a feel for what we're, what we're talking about here today. Yeah, so Midwest Access Coalition is an abortion fund but unlike traditional abortion funds that pay for someone's procedure, we pay for all of the practical um, support costs that a client might need to actually make their appointment. Um, uh, something that a lot of people don't know is that when someone schedules an abortion appointment, there's about a 50% um, drop off um, from that initial appointment. And it's not because people are changing their minds. Abortion is very popular, but it's because they, their transportation fell through um, their low income job. They don't feel like they can miss the day off work. Um, over 50% of the clients we support are already parenting. And so um, they had something come up with their childcare. Um, all of these reasons, um, allow for people to make more than one appointment when trying to access their care. And obviously that's only been exacerbated um, with the Dobbs decision and people having to travel 200 miles um, or more um, to their destination. So we pay for and book transportation, accommodations. We give money for childcare, medicine, um, food, anything else outside of procedural costs that a client needs to receive the care that they need and deserve. That's uh, that's a lot, and I can. So, how long have you been in operation? We first started fundraising in 2014, so we're actually not that old of an organization. And one of the reasons we were founded is because there was a. Um, group of people in New York City that were doing similar work that folks realized and saw, especially in Chicago, where we were founded that, you know, people were coming from all over the country to access reproductive care and abortion care in Chicago. Um, but that it was, you know, taking time out of the clinic's day um, to have all of these appointments on the books and people not showing up. And we wanted to reduce those barriers to have people access the care that um, they wanted. And so um, we've obviously grown every year just with deeper connections in our communities, with other abortion funds and clinics. Um, but as these laws continue to chip away at our fundamental health care rights. Um, and we're just lucky that we were able to really come up to speed um, around the Dobbs decision where we went from an all volunteer ran organization um, to now I think there's 13 paid staff. So we would be able to meet this moment and the demand that we're seeing now. That's incredible. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's where I was kind of going. It's like, I'm sure that, you know, your whole life changed um, after the Dobbs decision and the bans started um, getting enacted um, in the various states. Um, and so now you uh, now you help people come from all over uh, the country to go to Chicago, to Illinois, somewhere in Illinois, right? Well, really anywhere. So um, Illinois has seen the highest increase of any other state in the country post Dobbs, but Kansas is still providing care. Minnesota is providing care. Um, Iowa and Nebraska, um, Ohio. Um, <laughs> thankfully, yeah. we saw that big electoral yeah. win 
um, a few months ago, and people are also still fighting. So we see ballot initiatives in places like Missouri and Nebraska, where we have, you know, recent history to show you that abortion is a winning issue, something that I know you talk about in your your work, Deb, um, and now yeah. um, we really have the kind of proof in the pudding to show people. That's right. Um, well, we and, haven't been know, exaggerating this message for decades. Right, right. And then, uh, yeah, and so, yeah, we saw in, in all these states, uh, you know, the four states that added it to their constitution, you know, I think in Michigan, Ohio, uh, maybe California, another one I can't remember offhand, but um yeah, so unfortunately in Indiana, we do not have the ballot initiative option, um, which makes yeah. us really uh, disadvantaged in expressing uh, the majority will in this in this state. So um, so we're, of course, very grateful for your services. And so um, <laughs> you'd said earlier, Indiana is like like uh, the biggest state or that's the one that you get the most second biggest. In wow. 2023, so just to show you our growth, we saw our first clients in 2015, and we supported 30 clients that year. Um, in 2023, we supported over 1,800 clients, and so wow. we just continue to steadily grow. But yeah, in 2023, our uh, five states where we supported the most clients from was, number one was Texas. That was over a third of all of our clients and I would say, you know, three years prior to 2023, we saw eight Texas clients. So wow. you can see how much that has really shifted. Um, number two was Indiana. And Indiana is a state, you know, you know better than I do that has always had to travel, unfortunately, for their abortion care where providers were stopping at 15 weeks and, um, you know, Hoosiers were traveling to Chicago or here to Southern Illinois to get that care. Um, we still continue to support a majority of people from Illinois um, because I think it's our home state. And even with it expanding so much access and getting so many new care providers, you used to be able to schedule an appointment in 24 hours and now people are waiting three weeks. And so there wow. can be a lot of support needed in that time difference. And then of course, Tennessee and Wisconsin, we saw a large concentration from as well. Wow. Well, that's, and yeah, so that's interesting. You know, um, Indiana's um, latest abortion ban became effective um, in late August. So I'm sure you've gotten a lot since then, but I think you're right. Even before then, you know, we had such a laundry list of restrictions in Indiana. That it in was, confusion. Yeah. Yeah. It was just crazy. Just, I mean, it still is crazy. That's the so, biggest thing. Yeah, that's the biggest thing that, you know, happens when these abortion bans come down or Supreme or court decisions is that most people accessing this care don't know what their laws are. They just see in the headlines that abortion is banned and they think that that affects them. And, and I think that's, you know, the anti-choice you know, quote unquote, pro-life movement um, is to instill fear and to confuse people. And so we just want Hoosiers and everybody in all 50 states to know we can, you can still get an abortion and there are people out there to help you pay for your procedure and get to your procedure. Do not be afraid. We are trained professionals to help you and you are so loved and deserving of this care. Um, please reach out to your state abortion fund or to us at Midwest Access Coalition so we can support you. You shouldn't have to face this alone. Yeah, that I mean, and that's really wonderful. I don't even know if we have um, an Indiana one. I know Indiana now is working on some things. But um, but I'm not sure what is even available when I look out, for, you know, and research for people who are providing this support. Um, they're mostly national. Um, and there's not, there's not any that I found specifically in Indiana, um, but maybe they're out there. And they're I not really national. So Indiana has the Hoosier Abortion Fund that funds um, procedural costs. Um, but they and they run a diaper bank and provide some other. Um, resources for pregnant and parenting folks, but they aren't able to do practical support at this time. So, you know, as Midwest Access Coalition, we really cover the state of Indiana and we have um, 
a great little volunteer group in our signal chat where we can call on a few good Hoosiers. We, we've we collected people in all corners of the state. So if there's an emergency where we can't really support someone, that we do have some good people in the state that we can call on. Oh, that's wonderful. And I know I've run into many women who say, how can I help? I want to help. I want to drive people to where they need to get. Um, so in Indiana, um, prior to the ban, um, there were about 8,000 abortions every year in Indiana. And so, um, and since the ban, um, there have been uh, 17 um, that fit within the I exceptions. saw that in the news last week. I was really surprised to see that. Yeah, I'm surprised that many fit into the exceptions and were actually performed. I mean, under all the restrictions, because even if you fit onto the exceptions, which are fatal fetal anomaly, which, uh, you know, I always like to point out that it's not a medical diagnosis. Nobody knows what that means. Doctors, you know, they don't know for <laughs> sure, you know, that nobody know that's not an appropriate, you know, it's not appropriate language for a real exception that's you know usable. Uh, that's one mm -hmm. exception. The other one is um, uh, life, uh, saving the life of the mother, a serious health risk. Uh, again, what is a doctor supposed to do with that? Um, you know, what is a serious health risk um, and how close to death does the woman have to be? Um, and then of course the third is uh, rape or incest, but that's only up to 10 weeks post fertilization. Um, so particularly- And if you can women, prove it. And we, as right, a person right. who has experienced sexual assault in their lifetime, we know that, you know, those cases and kits go untested and unsupported, oh, yeah. you know. Yeah. But, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Indiana's um, sitting on thousands and thousands of untested um, so rape kits. So, um, and I think the last figure I heard, and this isn't current, well, I mean, it could be, uh, was something like 12% of reported rapes are actually prosecuted. Um, you know, it's just, you know, I mean, and so you can see why women uh, often just say, okay, I'm just going to move on, uh, you know, but, um, exactly. but if you become pregnant, then you have to, uh, you know, go through the whole thing. Um, and frankly, I think, um, you know, I'm wondering if, if a woman was raped and um, didn't go in immediately to do, you know, the, do the rape kit, um, that, you know, then came back and said I was raped and I, you know, I became pregnant and of course I want an abortion. Um, you know, how, what kind of skepticism? So only one of those 17 cases uh, in Indiana where an abortion was actually performed was uh, due to a rape or incest. So it could have been either one. Um, so, um, right. So those are the, those are the exceptions in Indiana. But even if you fall into those exceptions, there are, um, you know, another, there's another laundry list of restrictions. Uh, you know, you have to do the, you know, two trips, you have to, you know, if you're doing medication abortion, it has to be in person, there's no telemedicine, um, you know, you have to go to the doctor, the doctor has to physically hand you the, the abortion pill, and you have to actually ingest it while you are there. Um, and then, um, you know, there's all kinds of a myriad of uh, restrictions, it's just ridiculous. Of course, the doctor also has right. to um, give you this little speech, it's written out in the statute, what they have to say, which is this myth that um, you can, that a, a medication abortion is reversible <laughs> if you don't take the second pill. Ridiculous. I mean, it is not, that is so, it is just not true. Um, so, uh, so there's Medical all kinds of other information things. in this country. No wonder so many people didn't trust the COVID process is when we have legislators like this, you know, mandating right. medical misinformation I don't, don't put, it's, it's you know, um, people being afraid of the system because it's, I w never want, you know, a legislator who is a plumber in their, um, you know, full-time position writing laws about what to do with my uterus, you know, it's like, right. that's not the kind of plumbing we're talking about here. So I just don't understand <laughs> right. I mean, yes, we I think we've all heard crazy quotes by legislators, you know, saying, well, I mean, I heard one where a legislator said, well, the you know, the rape kit, if you do the rape kit, then that just cleans everything out. So you can't get pregnant. Like, oh, that's <laughs> like, uh, you know, I spent 10 years of my career doing political work in Missouri, and I had the fortunate um, position in 2012 to follow infamous 
Todd Aiken around the state when he was running against Claire McCaskill, who said, you know, if it was a legitimate rape, a woman could shut the whole thing down. And it's yeah, just that preposterous. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, just the crazy um, stuff that people put in there. And, you know, and that ends up in actual, you know, legislation and law. I mean, it, it is shocking right. to me that Indiana allows this, you know, untrue medical statement into a statute and requires doctors to say it. I mean, it was shocking. Yeah. And the court upheld it in Indiana. So it was it was bizarre. Well, and it goes back to your point, too, about, um, you know, the exceptions in Indiana and how we were both kind of shocked that even 17 were allowed to come through. And I think, right. you know, that's a political play to show that these people aren't the monsters that they really are. But we also are becoming smarter than that. We know better. We've seen the court decisions out of Texas and Idaho who have said that there's no um, medical intervention uh, for these pregnancies. Um, and I'm worried that that's going to be the new kind of. Yeah, that will be the new fire time. that right. is spread across our country in 2024 um, when the Center for Reproductive Rights has taken up um, these cases in Texas and Tennessee to prove that, you know, people who need abortions are in medical emergencies and need that help in the state or um, the state or the court system is saying, no, they don't exist. I mean, what that tells women and what that ingrains into women's brains um, and people who can get pregnant brains um, is just that we don't know our own bodies. We, you know, our lives and our bodies aren't valued. Um, right. And Right. It's that's a really tough pill to swallow. It is. It, you know, the the notion that people who can get pregnant are second class citizens, uh, not right. entitled to the same constitutional um, guarantees of personal liberty and freedom from government um, intrusion. Um, but uh, if you you know, and if you're pregnant, um, you know, you have lost all your rights. So. Right. So anyway, it just it just keeps reminding me about how important the work that you are doing is um, to women all around the country. I can't imagine, and especially you. young women who don't know stuff. Oh my God. Well, and you, I mean, it's 2024 and it's January 9th. And I, you know, like to think I'm a recovering politico, but we're coming into a big election year. And, you know, you ask and people ask all the time what they can do. And of course, getting involved in their, um, local abortion fund, not only donating, but, you know, volunteering, uh, driving people um, who need care. You don't have to, you know, do this in secret. We need to be out loud and proud about it. And just talking about abortion on your social media or with your family means so much more than what you think that it does. But this election season is going to be huge. We're waiting for a Supreme Court decision. This can change the balance of the presidency and of Congress and what that means. Um, so much is at stake for reproductive rights and, you know, trans rights, um, yeah. quite frankly, that, you know, voting in every single election, um, even that school board election is so important. Um, these people move up the leadership ladder um, to gain more power and to, you know, put more restrictions um, on our human rights and our health care. Um, but also, why does it take us like seven times to ask a woman to run for office before she'll say yes? Like, you can run for office. I have been a lobbyist for nearly 15 years, and I'm here to say you, good listener, are way more qualified than half of the people in your Capitol buildings or on your city council. So run for office. If you're fed up, Deb and I will help you yes. get the tool you need to succeed because I'm tired and we're just our whole lives are at stake right now and I'm you know just this week was the anniversary of the insurrection like 
we can do yes. this. We can make well, a change yes. in our country and we have to now. Right, right. Well, and in Indiana, you know, that is our only option. Um, there is no ballot initiative. There's no going out and getting a million signatures to change this situation. It's the only option is to elect pro-choice people to uh, the state legislature. So, um, you know, and of course- and federal, so we can get this done in Congress and all 50 states can have the access to abortion care again before we're talking about generations of potential trauma like we yeah. saw, you know, prior to 1973. And, you, you know, get one person that had an illegal abortion pre-row on the show. People will see, you know, um, what that was like. Thankfully, we don't have to yeah. go exactly back to those days. We have medication abortion now. Yes. It's yes. available in all 50 states. You can get it mailed to you um, legally through um, a clinic in Massachusetts, or you can get it through other ways online. Um, so the care is available um, in so many forms, but now we're talking about criminalization and legal yeah. challenges. And, you know, you might have, and we've seen this in Indiana, you know, someone was arrested for their miscarriage and um, Pruvi Patel a couple of years ago. And so, we want to make sure everyone is safe and gets the care that they need, which best suits them. Um, yes, and there are so many crazy issues with this. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, the whole conflation of, you know, miscarriage and abortion, which is technically the same thing. Um, but, you know, women who have spontaneous abortions, you know, I mean, I think, and I'm sure you know this too, like 20, a full 25% of all pregnancies, you know, don't make it just naturally. They don't make it. Um, for one reason or another. And so, and that's one of having... our biggest things actually in this mm -hmm. post Dobbs world is just confirming pregnancies because the miscarriage rate is so high that most obstetricians and gynecologists won't get you in to have an ultrasound until you're after you're 10 weeks pregnant um, because of that rate of miscarriage. And so if you're trying to confirm your pregnancy in Indiana or another banned state, that could be very difficult by ultrasound for you to do um, just because the machines are few and far between and the mm -hmm. standard of care is that, you know, this pregnancy might not be around by the time we give right. you that ultrasound. And so pre your abortion or post your medication abortion, if you want to confirm that all the tissue um, has been removed, you know, it's, it's just so difficult to get that care. Um, and there's so many implications for that regarding infant and maternal mortality, which is, mm -hmm double yeah. that of white women for people of color in every oh, yeah. state in our country. Um, Indiana is so the I don't... third worst maternal mortality rate in the country. And for a women of color, it's actually triple the rate. In Heartbreaking. And so it is. things are so connected and those statistics are only going to get worse mm -hmm. if we aren't including abortion justice as a part of this medical decision making for our lives. Right. I mean, um, you know, the fact that abortion is so much more medically safe than carrying a pregnancy, mm -hmm. you know, just, you know, the obvious conclusion is that if less people are able to have an abortion, there will be a higher rate of maternal mortality uh, because, yeah. you know, it is just it's more dangerous than having an abortion. Um, yeah. So uh, and, and in Indiana, we have uh, many uh, healthcare deserts. Still, uh, so particularly for prenatal right. care, I mean, it was a full thirty percent of the counties had no prenatal care available. So, um, you know, at any price. Deb, were you, you all know. a Medicaid expansion state? Have you ex um, expanded Medicaid yet? We have expanded it uh, at the bottom level some, uh -huh. and then also um, uh, it, we uh, passed a law that allowed Medicaid to serve um, postnatal moms for up to a year. Um, Although I was never convinced. The bare that minimum. Was, Thanks, Indiana. <laughs> right, right. And I wasn't even really convinced that the way the law was written, that it would actually happen. It was like it gave them the option to do it. 
Um, so they must like, have stolen that from Missouri. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, I believe it. Manigans. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, so I wasn't even really sure. I was like, well, does this really have to happen? Or is it somebody can say, yeah, we, we don't have to. So, it, you know, it's really just, it's just poor. And, and again, it, if, if you live in a third of the states in um, Indiana that don't have prenatal care, you know, it doesn't matter. I mean, if you can't travel, you know, you're not going to get prenatal care, which of course will lead to higher maternal mortality rates. Um, you yeah. know, without any prenatal care. I mean, that's just that's just an obvious conclusion. So, all right. So, um, I so tell me how far do women come to get to Illinois to have abortion care? Oh, we saw people. We supported people in 2023. One person from New York. People from Arizona. Um, we're seeing. Because there's um, a couple of new clinics in Illinois, um, on the southern Illinois border, down in Carbondale, Illinois, which you might be familiar with. I think, you know, it's an hour from Missouri. It's an hour to Kentucky. It's an hour to Indiana. It's just the most perfect location. And um, yeah. as of yesterday, I um, attended a ribbon cutting for a new Planned Parenthood of Illinois location there. So um, Carbondale, who had zero providers last year, now has three abortion providers. Nice. Um, is really serving that whole region, but it's um, a small college town. So it doesn't have a major yeah. airport and people are driving from Texas, from Mississippi, wow. from Louisiana um, every day to get that care. Um, driving to Kansas. Um, but really it's everywhere and i you know we're paying really close attention to the supreme court decision that should come out any time now out of florida because florida i think has had the second largest increase um since dobbs surprisingly even though they're a state very similar to indiana that only go to 15 weeks in care but um here at hope clinic in granite city illinois they've been seeing clients from Puerto Rico or the Bahamas because they fly into Florida to get care. And if they're past 15 weeks, they're coming to Illinois to get care from the Bahamas because it's illegal there. And so wow. it's not even in our country anymore. It's outside of our country. People that are coming to us um, and having to have multiple stops along the way um, because that care is so out of reach now yeah. and so yeah. um well i'm it's just really uh, devastating you know, it's, just, what it's wonderful what in illinois is doing and um you know we're very lucky to be neighbors um uh with illinois considering um what we have to go through here in indiana so um and so in illinois um is uh the right to abortion in your constitution or is that um something that might be in the works or it is just by statute i don't want I don't think it's in the in, in the Constitution, but in 2019, we kind of did see the writing on the wall here, and we passed, um, I think we were the second country to pass the Reproductive Health Act, which got rid of all of our old institutional kind of bad laws that were on the books um, that weren't being enforced, but, you know, could one day if something were to happen. And so we clean that up. We've passed shield laws to protect um, providers, patients, and support networks like myself. You know, I live on the border with Missouri. I'm in the St. Louis region and I have family in Missouri. So I'm afraid to go back there sometimes, even though right. I- Right, so yeah, explain that, explain that there. shield law. Can tell us more about um, that shield law. What is it? state is different. Illinois has one. California, um, Massachusetts. Um, ours is just saying that, you know, the law enforcement in Illinois is not allowed to work with law enforcement in other states to turn over information regarding someone accessing abortion care, whether it's, you know, a provider, a patient, or a support network. Um, that they're protected um, and we are able to follow Illinois law and are thus doing everything legally. You know, this was really important after we saw with SBA out of Texas with the kind of bounty hunter law and um, the 
creator of that law is now going to border cities um, like Danville, Illinois, which is on the border of Indiana, um, some Indiana, an Indiana abortion provider out of Indianapolis was trying to open a new clinic in Danville, Illinois, to continue to support Hoosiers. And this guy came to town from Texas to pass, uh, you know, um, defenders of the unborn law or whatever to you know, try to get the, the, the small rural town to, you know, not allow people to use their roads to come to care, you know, um, in their town. And, um, it's just totally illegal and, you know, infringes on our interstate travel laws, which are, you know, federal laws, but, um, president, President Trump got so many of his anti-choice judges appointed to every level of court in this country that some of these crazy laws are going to be upheld um, just because of the way the courts have been stacked. And so um, we're working really hard to protect everyone that comes here. Um, we take security and digital security at Midwest Access Coalition very seriously and have a lot of information on our website for people who might be worried um, if they're pregnant and need to choose an abortion or to terminate um, to take those extra steps for them. Um, but right now we feel really safe and proud to be in Illinois um, that we're not just going to hand people over to yeah. their respective governments for accessing, right. I'm sure, you know, yeah. I'm sure that's care. a major fear for, for women seeking care, you know, even going to another state, you know, because there have been threats by attorney generals, you know, we'll get your records it's from not, wherever you go. Not just them. It's their loved ones. Their loved ones are threatening them. Their boyfriends, their abusers are telling them, you know, if you go to Illinois to get an abortion, you're going to go to jail. And it's just absolutely untrue. Um, and some of it is malicious. And some of it is just because there's so much fear and confusion right. in they the reporting know. and people not understanding what's happening um, because it's right. so different in every location. So it's a really new challenge that we have to address um, in the work that we do, in the work that clinics do to calm those fears and nerves and let patients know that we're still going to support them in their care. That's awesome. I know in Texas, uh, or um, um, they, um, they, there were some local government, like county governments, who were trying to make it illegal to yeah. use a specific road that led to Oklahoma, where you on could the border to New Mexico? That's right. what's happening. Oh, New Mexico, right? So, um, so yeah, yeah. So I think in Indiana, I guess we will have to be looking for that, won't we? Looking for people to come and try to, um, and you know, make it illegal Indiana, to use a road know, to get to it Illinois. Could happen, it could happen in Illinois too. And just because we have these shield laws doesn't mean that you know every local police department or sheriff's office is going to uphold, you know, Illinois law or even federal law. When we talk about the FACE Act and, you know, the harassment clients face and patients face and providers outside of clinics with these protesters, it's, it's beholden to who your local law enforcement is sometimes. Yeah, and so um, if you do have an experience where someone's trying to harass you or lie to you or bully you out of your procedure, you know, let someone know so we can figure out the ways to uh, address that because um, there are protections in places on the books, but they're only, they're new. And so they've never been tested. And also, you know, law enforcement, you know, works in some places and not in others. And so there's a little bit of education to be done with law enforcement here in Illinois about what those laws are that protect abortion care and how they should or should not act um, regarding. Yeah. So I want to talk for a minute about this, uh, you know, the uh, Kate Fox, I think was her name out of Texas, um, who, mm -hmm. you know, tried to do everything right and, um, you know, needed a later term abortion because um, as in all cases, um, fatal fetal anomalies um, are not detected until often 20 weeks. 
Um, that's actually when they do the test um, to see if there are any genetic, um, you know, you know, misalignments and, you know, problems. And that's what happened to her, although she was, I don't think she was quite 20 weeks, but they did find that she uh, did have this, um, you know, 95% chance of, uh, you know, the, the bringing the baby to term or getting it out and it would die. It was not going to, it was not going to make it. Um, and so she ended up, you know, she went to the court, the court said no. Uh, well, of course, the first court said yes, which, you know, it was a, a woman judge who said, well, hell, yes, of course, of course, you should be able to, yes, you should be able to get a what? Why? Because we know how her childbirth is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, why, yeah. And so, and then, of course, you know, it was taken to the appellate court, and that's where, um, you know, some judge said, well, no, the uh, lower court ruling was incorrect because she said in there that it, it was being done in the and the doctor's um, best judgment. And the statute says that it has to be in good judgment or some crazy, you know, you know, syntax or something, you know, sure. that uh, <laughs> said that she was not allowed to have this, um, this abortion in this really terrible situation. Um, and so she ended up traveling. Do you know where she traveled to? I can't remember. I think it was Colorado. No, I don't actually. So, um, so, these, you know, I, and I'm, I suppose that you're seeing more of these cases too. I mean, um, where they are later term abortions that are, you know, necessary for, you know, I mean, these have to be the most, bred, you know, of the cases where women wanted to get pregnant, did get pregnant, were very happy they were pregnant, told everybody they knew that they were pregnant and were going to have a baby. Everyone was very excited. They've gotten, you know, made plans for this new baby. And then they find out that, there, you know, there's a problem. Um, I mean, and the problems are always, you know, I mean, they're just ridiculously significant. I mean, the brain is outside the skull or, you know, I mean, I mean, really, really terrible, um, terrible, uh, you know, terrible problems uh, with the fetus um, that would not allow them to live. And so um, and so Ed, you are working probably with those kinds of cases. All the time. But, you know, sometimes people don't even really tell us why they're getting an abortion, you know, um, when we know how far along they are in their pregnancy, sometimes we can guess what's going on. But also because 14 states and counting have banned abortion now and others have just made it really difficult. You know, I told you earlier that most abortions prior to Dobbs could be scheduled within 24 hours. And now we're scheduling three weeks out. And so right. even people who... um are doing an elective abortion sometimes have to get one later in pregnancy just because right. of them being pushed out from their state. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really sad when someone has a wanted pregnancy and then their, you know, government doesn't trust them to make the decisions to, right. you know, keep their family intact. And, um, we're really proud at Midwest Access Coalition. Um, in those cases, we'll pay for burial services um, for a lot of people's religious reasons. Um, they want to be able to um, bury their fetus. Um, and so we'll support clients in that way. And we've come across some um, good mortuaries across the country that have been able to support us in that work. And then other times it's very difficult. I have a good friend from Missouri who was told she could never get pregnant, you know, was a statistic and got pregnant on her wedding and um, on her um, honeymoon. Oh. <laughs> and as a newlywed, you know, they had to take a loan out from their bank um, they were Missourians to travel all the way to Colorado um, to terminate their fetal anomaly. Um, and at the time, you know, this was years ago at the time, this was during the, you know, baby body parts, David Dildine, um, Planned yeah. Parenthood expose. And so um, the state of Missouri wouldn't let um, the remains um, be sent back to Missouri from Colorado because she was Jewish to bury her son, you know? And so these have devastating impacts on families that are already grieving. Um, yeah. I love yeah. that. Like Hope Clinic for Women in Granite City um, will do, you know, hand or feet 
footprints or, you know, make a little collection box for people. Um, there's so much sympathy for those cases um, from the abortion community and not at all any from, you know, legislative governments. And so um, we're just trying to do the best to take care of our community. And it's really heartbreaking that anybody should have to face these barriers, um, not just people with um, fetal anomalies, but it's just ridiculous the amount of trouble um, people have to go through to take care of their reproductive health in this country. Right. So, um, okay. So tell us um, what people can do to help your organization. I know I'm, I assume you're a nonprofit 501c3. Yeah. And yeah, always- we are, of course. Always looking for donations. donations. Of course, yes. you, yeah, you can go to MidwestAccessCoalition.org and make a donation there. Or um, we have a great new cohort of new board members um, that are trying to get things up, like house parties. I know um, a few great abortion providers a year or two ago in Indianapolis through kind of a house party for us and did a small fundraiser. And that was your yeah, nice. own abortion providers just because they wanted to get the word out to Hoosiers that, you know, this care and support is available um, to them. And this was during the time when Indiana was, you know, stop, go, stop, go on abortion before right, the right. last kind of right. ban took effect. Um, and so donating is always good. Like I mentioned, just talking about abortion and that help is available for people is the most important. I think people think that that's not impactful. Talking about abortion as healthcare is very impactful. You know, it's been so stigmatized for 50 years and we're finally taking that back. And I think the people who saw us as um, social issue or... Um, something that didn't affect them have, you know, since changed their minds post Dobbs, which is a, you know, double it was just, it sucks, but it's also, you know, welcome. <laughs> I'm glad you're yes. here now, you know, um, right. running for office, making sure you vote, um, supporting those pro-choice, pro-abortion candidates, and then volunteering in your own community, Um there are things to that you can do, I think, whether it's with an organization or not, um, putting together or getting donations for aftercare kits for abortion seekers, you know, pads, oh. um, heating yeah. pads. Um, you know, I had a client one time who was flying back home and she was in the TSA line um, at the airport in Chicago and started, um, you know, bleeding into her pants and how to get out of line so I could Ugh. send her money to get a new pair of sweatpants so she wouldn't be embarrassed in the airport you know and so like all of these small little things like where you can stock a clinic's closet or a support organization's closet to give these one-offs to people um you know you always forget something when you're traveling yeah. so toothbrushes toothpaste, you know, like whatever, like all of these things could be useful. And we really, you know, love your enthusiasm and support for whatever kind of creative ideas y'all think of. And so reach out and see what you can do, get a little, you know, supply party together. Um, I'm sure you, you know, when I go to a hotel, I keep all of my toothpaste and shampoos and lotions and everything in a bag now, and I save them for clients. And so save that kind of stuff, send it to us. Um, I mean, That's the great. opportunities yeah. are endless. And I, I've, I think yeah. I've been in this work for 15 years now, and sometimes I don't think of the creativity anymore. Um, but um, crisis is the mother of all invention. And we, we love yes. to hear um, what you've got in store. Oh, that's great. Well, that's wonderful. Yeah. So, and yeah, we, you know, we're working hard to go around the state and talk about abortion as much as we can. I just did another talk last night and, um, and I will say, I always learn something. There's always some stories that, you know, that I had not heard before that, you know, are often just heartbreaking. Um, and that's you, you know, your I mean, core. Yes. And, you know, I mean, and that's the, you know, that's what's so difficult about this issue is that it's just so completely complex. You know, every pregnancy is very unique, and um, and 
you know, it's a different journey for everyone. So, um, and so it's really, you know, just putting a blanket law on anything like that. It's just, it's just untenable. So, um, so anyway, well, thank you so much for talking with us about this. And, um, you know, let's, you know, we'll keep on going. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So we'll keep going. Yes. Um, I certainly do want to echo your recommendation. Please run. We need pro-choice women to run. Our Indiana State Legislature still only has 25% um, representation of women, uh, which is ridiculous. And this is, you know, how these things happen. Um, because we don't have women in leadership, we're getting these crazy laws uh, from people who don't know anything about what they're passing laws on. So we need exactly. more uh, pro-choice women in our legislature, and that is really our only option to fix this. Um, and let me just lay on top of that the um, crazy fear that we should be considering if uh, if Joe Biden doesn't win, if if you know if Trump, <laughs> God forbid, is our uh, president again, or frankly, I think any Republican uh, wins the presidential <laughs> race, uh, the um, uh, the um, let's see. You know, I, I'd always forget the, the, the name, the heritage. No, it's not the heritage. Uh, anyway, so this um, it's the document called the Project 2025, which is the, um, oh, kind of the you know, the plan um, for any Republican leader. And it's just shocking. I mean, it's just shocking, shocking, yeah. you know, that it's that publicly, I mean, that it contains all of these directives for the next uh, Republican president to, you know, do away with any, you know, plan, uh, Planned Parenthood funding. Uh, any, you know, family planning has to talk about, uh, you know, that a family is really only a man and a woman, um, that that's really the only legitimate um, family style. I mean, there's just so many things in this Project 25, 2025 document that is just, you know. Very scary, and it's far beyond yeah. abortion. So if there is yes. an issue you care about, it's in there, and it's serious. This is a yeah, playbook is that they have to use directly from the anti-choice movement, and yeah. we have to do everything. Thing to combat, you know, this fascist takeover of the United right. States. I just have to say that we talked about the, you know, anniversary of the insurrection. It's this yeah. is our reality, and we have to wake up and and fight and deal with it. Yeah, it's yeah. There's just so much um, at stake um, this year. Agreed. So um, so we will keep working, and you will keep working. Um, so um, you know, between all of us, we can we can do it. Thanks thank so, much, so much, Deb. Thank you. And so, and good luck. And, um, and, you know, I look forward to checking in again and seeing, you know, how thank it's going because it's, you know, it's only going to get crazier for a while, but anyway, all right. Well, thank you for all of your work, Allison. This is so wonderful. And, you know, from women all over the world, you know, thank you. Um, you know, somebody's looking Thanks, out Dad. for us. All right.